Okay. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> good morning, good day, good evening, good night. Welcome to our seminar. Today we have a guest, as a guest, our speaker, Professor Mikhail Chebotar from Kane State University of United States. And he will speak on polynomials over nil rings. Uh, please, Misha, you can start. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers. It's a great pleasure to give a talk on your seminar. And I will be speaking about polynomials over nil rings, and I will start with some obvious definitions. So the first definition is a definition of a nilipotent ring. Uh, I believe everybody knows this definition, and I will give uh, also a very obvious example, uh, just uh, rings of strictly upper triangular matrices. And how about polynomials over nilpotent rings? So the ring of polynomials over nilpotent rings is just a nilpotent ring itself. So nothing interesting here. Uh, the next definition will be definition of a locally nilpotent ring. And uh, uh, here is just a precise statement of this definition. And the situation uh, with locally nilpotent rings could be considered as the same or as a different one. So, uh, first of all, we know that uh, all nilpotent rings are locally nilpotent. If uh, we will uh, consider polynomial rings over locally nilpotent rings, they will be also locally nilpotent. But there will be one interesting twist, which I will discuss in the second part of my talk about locally nilpotent rings. They are much more interesting as they uh, originally appear. An example of a locally nilpotent ring which is not nilpotent, uh, for example, we can consider rings of strictly upper triangle countable matrices with finitely many non zero entries. I will need a few more definitions. So uh, the next one is a definition of a nil ring. And uh, for polynomials over nil rings, we'll have a lot of interesting situations which we are going to discuss. And what is an example of a nil ring? which is not locally nilpotent. And here I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm not going to give you the example right now. All I will mention is that uh, in 1964, Evgeny Solomonovich Golod constructed uh, examples of finitely generated nil algebras, which are not locally nilpotent. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to give you another example a bit later but uh, this is already something very, very non-trivial. The next definition is a definition of a Jacobson radical ring. And uh, we are going to talk about them uh, because uh, this definition will be related to a very famous problem. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the next example is a very example, easy example to see that uh, Jacobson radical rings need not be nil. So, uh, Typical example is example of a power series with zero constant term. Uh, and I unfortunately, I will still need two more definitions. So the next one is a definition of a Behrens radical. A ring is called Behrens radical if uh, we cannot map this ring onto a ring with a non-zero idempotent. And next definition will be definition of a brown mccoy radical. So you can probably notice that after every definition, I was given an example, except the definition of Behrens radical. And again, we are going to discuss the reason a little bit later. The main problem is uh, that I don't know any easy example of a ring which is Behrens radical, but not Jacobson radical. And a ring is called brown mccoy radical if we cannot map it onto a simple ring with identity. And here is an interesting story. So do we really need this word simple? And it's obvious that uh, we really don't need it. If we can map a ring onto, uh, if you, you can make a ring onto a ring with identity, then obviously we can map it onto a simple ring with identity. The reason why I want to stress uh, this word simple because in some results, which we'll discuss, we are going to use the homomorphic image of a ring and we'll be playing uh, with the, uh, the, the situation that the ring should be simple. 
in one case, uh, we will simply avoid this and uh, we won't care about homomorphic images at all. Okay, so uh, here is an easy example of a ring which is brown macro radical but not Behrens radical. Uh, you can notice that uh, this ring of countable matrices with finitely many non zero edges is a simple ring. It doesn't contain a, an identity, so it's uh, certainly a, a brown macro radical but not Behrens radical because it contains a lot of idempotents. Okay, so here is uh, the situation about all definitions I mentioned. And uh, you can see this red embedding because I didn't provide you an example of a ring which is Behrens radical but not Jacobson radical. Again, if uh, you know some easy example, please let me know because this is a question which bothers me quite significantly. I will provide you an example in the very end of this talk, but it is not going to be a very simple example. Okay, so now we are going to move to some classical results. Uh, probably the most op uh, famous open problem in ring theory is the Cothic conjecture, which is still an open question. Here is uh, its uh, standard statement, which uh, for, uh, from my perspective is not the best statement because uh, when I give this to my undergraduate students, they are not too excited. Uh, and I'm going to state the following uh, result due to Krempa, which will give us some uh, better statements, especially for undergraduate students. So uh, the following statements are equivalent. The Cothic conjecture has a positive solution. Uh, the statement three and four will make undergraduate students happy ab about uh, uh, this wonderful open problem because they can start working. As long as they know what is a nil ring, they can start trying to prove it or to construct a count example. And uh, the second statement here is the statement which most of people in radical theory are thinking about. So some people believe that uh, polynomial ring over nil ring is a Jacobson radical. Some people believe this is not the case. And uh, the story started uh, uh, the story when uh, people started to think about new rings uh, began in 1956 with the problem by Mitsur. Uh, if R is a new ring, uh, can we check whether a polynomial ring over R is new or not? And Amitsur provided some uh, ideas that uh, this statement actually should be true uh, because he uh, constructed a new algebra over an uncountable field such that a polynomial ring is indeed new. And uh, this problem by Amitsur was open for more than 40 years until Agata Smoktonovich proved uh, uh, one of the most uh, brilliant results in uh, radical theory. Uh, this is an absolutely incredible theorem. <laughs> I read this paper and, and I, I, I was absolutely amazed. I mean, this is one of the best results I read in my life. You can see the example is very hard. And what is really interesting here is that when you read the final statement, you don't see the answer to Amitsur's problem. Notice his question was, uh, okay, so we have a nil ring and uh, is it true that uh, R bracket X a polynomial ring is a nil ring? The answer is, uh, of course not. Not true. But what is going to be this ring R is quite unclear because she had two variables. And uh, you, we have two options here. Maybe it's uh, A mod I, which can serve for R. Maybe it's A mod I uh, break it to U. So we couldn't get uh, the precise example from this wonderful theorem. However, uh, quite recently, uh, Pace Nielsen uh, simplified uh, this wonderful example and from his paper one can find precisely what will serve for a nil ring and what will serve for a polynomial ring. So uh, these are two wonderful results about uh, polynomial rings or nil rings uh, which show that they don't need to be nil. Okay so now let's look carefully at this wonderful impedance uh, and think about polynomial rings over nil rings. We already know by Smoktonovich result uh, that polynomial rings over nil rings need not be nil. How about Jacobson radical? Well, we learned that this is a, an analogy of the Cothic conjecture, so a big open problem. 
And now let me talk a little bit about two other embeddings, Behrens radical and brown macro radical. In 1993, Edmund Puchelowski asked whether uh, the polynomial ring over nil ring is brown macro radical. So uh, it means uh, whether we can map polynomial ring over nil ring onto a ring with identity. And uh, this problem was solved by Puchelowski and Smoktonovich in 1998. It was a very nice solution. I really love their proofs. I'm going to provide you the idea how to prove this theorem in a very different way. So they uh, solved this problem. They uh, actually got a much more general result. But uh, in a few seconds, you will see how to uh, do it uh, using just undergraduate mathematics, basically ideas from math Olympiads. And in uh, 2001, uh, Bader von Puchelowski proved that uh, a polynomial ring over nil ring is Behrens radical. And of course, it's stated here in terms of uh, rings with non zero idempotence. And uh, the difference between uh, these two theorems by Puchelowski, Smoktonovich, and Bader von and Puchelowski is that uh, Bader von and Puchelowski really used uh, ring structure ring theory. So it was a more uh, ring theoretical uh, result than a uh, result by Puchelowski and Smoktonovich, which uh, used also quite uh, interesting combinatorial ideas. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to give you an idea how to prove. Uh, theorem by Puchelovsky and Smoktonovich, uh, applying just uh, undergraduate mathematics. So we want to show that if R is a nil ring, uh, then uh, we cannot map polynomial ring over R onto a ring with identity. So how to do it? Well, we uh, suppose the contrary. If there is a homomorphism which sends a polynomial uh, onto a ring with one, then we are going to make some uh, elementary stra and strange transformations. For convenience, I will assume that uh, this polynomial is of odd degree. Uh, uh, in case of even degree, the, the, the proof will be, uh, the idea of the proof will be basically the same, just it will be the uh, difference with uh, the sign. Okay, so if this is a polynomial of the small de uh, smallest degree, what we are going to do, we are going to separate uh, add and even parts. So please see that in the left side of this equation, we have terms of odd degree, and in the right side, we have terms of even degree. Uh, just uh, the way how you would like to group uh, the terms, add in the left and even on the right. So what to do next? Uh, since we only have a new ring, uh, what we can do, we can take some powers and hopefully some terms will disappear. So what we are going to do, we are going to square uh, this expression. So if we square this expression, please notice what will happen. Uh, we have uh, add powers in uh, the left part of this equation. If you multiply x in the odd power by x in the odd power, we'll get x in the even power. So what we are going to get just a polynomial in x squared in the left part of the equation after we square. And uh, if we square a polynomial of even degree, we get a polynomial of even degree. So now what we have, we have in both parts uh, uh, just powers of x in even degree or polynomials in x squared as I wrote in this expression. So now we are just introducing a, a new variable. We say x1 equals x squared, and we move all x's in the left-hand side. And what we have? We have a polynomial in x1. And this polynomial is also of degree to n plus one as the original one. And what is really important here? The important part is this coefficient, b with the index to n plus one. This coefficient is just the previous leading coefficient but squared. And we are in the situation of a nil ring. So if you'll do this enough many times, we will simply able to get rid of the term uh, with a leading part. And uh, basically, this is just 
a very easy undergraduate math. And uh, it solves uh, the problem posed by Pushilovsky. Of course, it's not the best solution. Why it's not, uh, uh, it could be the easiest solution, but why it's not the best? Because unfortunately, it doesn't lead to uh, the solution of more interesting problems. Now, uh, let's consider polynomials in several indeterminates because this is basically uh, the main idea of my talk to talk about polynomials in several indeterminates. And let me mention two questions. Uh, I will start with the question by Puchilovsky and Smoktunovich. Uh, they asked whether the polynomial ring over nil ring in two or more variables, commuting variables, it's important, uh, is Brown McCoy radical. And it's quite interesting that in his 1993 paper, uh, Puchilovsky asked this question for the case of non commuting variables. So for, uh, he, he asked the question for one variable, and then he moved not to commuting variables, but to non commuting. And after Puchilovsky and Smoktunovich solved uh, the problem for one variable, they asked the question about commuting variables. And this question became very popular because it was mentioned almost in every paper which was related to polynomial rings uh, and, and radicals uh, <laughs> related to polynomial rings over nil rings. And uh, there were several attempts how to handle this problem. And fortunately, there were some results, some partial results. Uh, the most interesting part which connects these two questions uh, was obtained independently by Miguel Ferreira, Robert Wiesbauer, and Agata Smoktunovich. They were published in the same year. And uh, their theorem says that these questions are equivalent. Uh, then in uh, the same paper, Agata Smoktunovich proved a very interesting result if you read it not just like a theorem, but like of what it says for people interested in the Celtic conjecture. Uh, this theorem basically says, if you can construct a polynomial ring over nil ring and two commuting variables, uh, which is not brown macro radical, then congratulations, you have a counterexample to the Celtic conjecture. Well, uh, it would be too good to construct such an example. Uh, we tried to use the approach which I uh, mentioned uh, as an idea how to handle question by Puchilovsky, an proof of, of theorem by Puchilovsky and Smoktunovich. And uh, we were able to extend it just a little bit. So we were able to show uh, that a polynomial uh, ring over nil algebra is brown macro radical, provided that this is a nil algebra over a field of positive characteristic. And it was an obsession for many years what will happen if uh, we consider a nil algebra over a field of characteristic zero? In general, in most of uh, problems, a field of characteristic zero is much more interesting than field of positive characteristic. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, tell you how we were able to handle the case uh, for nil algebras over field of characteristic zero. Uh, but before that, I will need to give more definitions. So uh, it took for uh, our team, uh, which consisted of uh, Kevin Fon, Lee Paifei, and Edmund Puchilovsky and myself, it took uh, about 12 years uh, for four of us to work on the problem, which I'm going to discuss pretty soon. Before that, I should mention an absolutely shocking result. Uh, this is a solution of problem by Makar Limanov. And uh, when you are trying to prove that you cannot map a polynomial ring uh, over new ring in several variables, and you learn that actually uh, this ring contains a non-commutative free <laughs> k-algebra, then it, it becomes quite unclear whether uh, the question, uh, question one here has a positive solution or not. This is really, really uh, hard to believe that this is true. Maybe true, maybe not. So uh, this example was uh, somehow uh, 
something which we didn't realize that uh, could be a counterexample or not. I mean, it, it created a, a, a lot of uh, troubles between us. So we, we started to construct counterexamples, and of course, it's extremely hard. And uh, fortunately, we uh, got rid of that idea. Okay, so now uh, let me talk about how to use the structural ring theory uh, in order to uh, play uh, with uh, images of polynomial rings or nil rings. So first of all, uh, let me mention a very easy observation. If we consider an image of a nil ring, then uh, and this nil uh, ring is, uh, the image of nil ring is nil. Also, if we consider the image of polynomial ring over nil ring onto a simple ring, then uh, the image is a prime ring. Uh, it's quite interesting how we can work with uh, prime rings in this context. So uh, if we have a prime ring and our map is onto a simple ring, then the question is, okay, so how this prime ring and this simple ring are connected? And uh, in order to understand this connection, we need a definition of the extended centroid, which is also known as a Martindale centroid. And uh, this uh, term, extended centroid, could be understood as a center of any important ring of quotients for a prime ring. In this definition, I mentioned Martindale rings of quotients. But uh, if you will consider, for example, maximal right or maximal left ring of quotients, you can still uh, have uh, extended centroid is the center of that quotient ring. And another important notation is the notation of the central closure, uh, which is just a subring RC of the ring of quotients. Uh, here is a, a very important property of the extended centroid. So for every element, we can find a non-zero ideal such that uh, uh, C times this ideal is a subset of R. And uh, what is uh, the easiest possible example of uh, central closure and extended centroid? If you'll consider just a matrix ring or a ring of polynomials, uh, then RC would be the matrix rings over the field of rational functions. And C will be just uh, the set of scalar matrices over the field of rational functions. And uh, for quite some time, uh, there was an idea that uh, the use of central closure can help to solve the problem by Puchilovsky and Smoktunovich. And let me mention two problems posed by Bader in 203, which are related to this question. So the first problem was about the existence of prime ring with zero center, whose central closure is a simple ring with identity. And uh, the partial case of this problem was the second problem, uh, which deals with the prime nil ring. Uh, actually, if we could get a negative solution to the first problem, then the second problem would be solved negatively as well. And uh, there was a paper by Ferrer and Wiesbauer which showed that the second problem is equivalent to the question by Puchilovsky and Smuktanovich. So for quite some time, there was a belief that this question, question one by Bader, uh, has a negative answer. Fortunately or unfortunately, it had a positive answer and I'm going to show you the construction. The construction is not hard. So uh, I'm going to uh, give you the idea how to prove this theorem. It will be a, a very easy construction comparing to what was done by Agata Smuktunovich in her famous theorem. And uh, I believe that construction can be used for some other examples as well. How we start? We start with uh, the field of rational numbers. We need uh, infinitely many variables. And we uh, will consider the field of fractions of the polynomial ring in infinitely many variables. Uh, now, we consider uh, the ring of countable row of finite matrices. Uh, Eij is a standard matrix unit. So, so far I uh, didn't tell you anything interesting here. But now we come to the construction. The notation here will play the key role. 
So uh, let's look carefully at this notation. Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, have to think a little bit about this E, I, J, K. Uh, these are quite specific matrices. Uh, this K corresponds to the order of matrices. So K actually is related to 2 to the K by 2 to the K matrix. Uh, this I, J simply mean uh, that we are going to have this matrix unit, E, I, J. And now uh, the most important part, what are Y, I, J? These are very strange matrices. So uh, we have uh, on main diagonal matrices of the form X, E, I, J, K, and then X sub K, E, I, J, K, and then they will just uh, interchange. And, and I, I'm going to give you some examples, so maybe it will be easy uh, to visualize if you have some concrete i, j, and k. So what is uh, y, 1, 1, 0? We are talking about 2 to the 0 by 2 to the 0 matrix, so 1 by 1 matrix. We have x here, because of this 0, it will be x, x naught. And these uh, will be the elements of main diagonal. One more example, uh, y uh, one to one. So we are talking about uh, two by two matrices and uh, we will have in the position one, two variable X, then in the next matrix, it will be X one, then it will be X again and so on. So these are just very uh, strange elements and we are going to use them to generate uh, the algebra which will solve the problem by Bader. And all one need is just to understand what are these Y, I, J, Ks. And as soon as one understands uh, how these elements look like, the rest of this theorem that R is a prime ring with zero center and RC is a simple ring with identity is basically an exercise for a good undergraduate or uh, some graduate student. So. Uh, there is no hard mathematics there as long as we understand what are these yij k's are. Okay, so uh, now uh, we are coming to the second problem by Bader, and this problem has a positive solution. So uh, the central closure of a prime neural ring contains no identity element. And uh, as uh, we mentioned before, uh, this problem is equivalent to two other theorems. Uh, uh, and uh, the question is, which one is to prove? So uh, you probably uh, noticed that I said solution of the second problem by B there in this corollaries. So it means that we are going to use some structural ring theory and discuss how to prove this, uh, that the central closure of a prime neural ring contains no identity element. Uh, this is a very uh, hard proof. So uh, among all my results, this is probably the most difficult one. And I want to tell you just a few words about uh, what kind of ideas were used in the proof. Again, it was work by four people for more than 12 years. So uh, the first uh, idea is to really use the central closure. So why? it is better to play with the central closure than to play with uh, polynomials over new rings. So uh, the first observation is that if you have a non-zero ideal of a prime ring, then the central closure of that uh, nil ideal will be equal to the central closure of the whole ring. So it means uh, we can actually play with any non-zero ideal of a prime neural ring, it could be quite useful. Okay, why, why it could be quite useful? Here is a very easy example to understand. We want to group terms uh, when we are playing with uh, neural rings. We want to find some smart, smart ways how to do it. And if we have uh, an element, A0 plus A1C, where A0 and A1 are in the ideal I, and we have the property that CI is an R, then this is an important element because it belongs to R, but can we say the same about the polynomial A0 plus A1x? Uh, certainly not. So uh, if we use elements of the central closure, uh, then of course uh, we can find some ways how to group terms. 
and uh, the central closure can really help us to do it. And I'm going to discuss how we can do it, but we will be using another interesting approach related to so-called Newton polytopes. Uh, since I, I, we were quite obsessed with this problem by Puchilovsky and Bader, and many people were asking, okay, so what kind of problems you are working on? And I remember a conversation with Lenny Makarlimanov, uh, who said, uh, you know, when you are working with polynomials in many variables, then basically you don't have the degree. In the sense that there are so many different degrees. And he said that uh, folks who are working on algebraic geometry, they prefer to think about Newton polytope. And I remember uh, uh, when Edmund heard this because uh, we had the conference here in Kent and, and uh, uh, four of us were here. And then Edmund Pichlovsky said, maybe this is the right idea. Maybe we should do something with the Newton polytope. However, it was absolutely unclear how to use it. So what is a Newton polytope? Here is a definition. We need to think about exponents or variables. And uh, there is a very important property. Newton polytope uh, of a product is a subset of the uh, Minkowski sum of two Newton polytopes. Notice that I uh, made no uh, restrictions on these coefficients. This is the reason why we don't have equality. Many people work with polynomials over fields and they have equality here. And uh, what is uh, the examples? So it's, it will be easier to visualize just if you consider the examples of Newton polytopes. Uh, if this is a Newton, uh, uh, if this is a polynomial, uh, then what we need to do, we need to look at uh, the points with coordinates three and two. Uh, then the next one is one, one. Uh, then the next one is zero, four and the final one is the origin, zero, zero, and all we need is just to connect uh, the uh, points outside, and we'll have this one, one inside. So the very simple idea of a, a, a convex hull. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going just to square this polynomial and see what will happen. Okay, if I square this polynomial, then I will get this uh, Newton polytope, and since I made no restrictions about uh, the coefficients, uh, then uh, we can just say that the Newton polytope for this uh, polynomial squared is contained inside this triangle. Uh, so what, uh, how Newton polytopes can help us? Well, first of all, since I make no restrictions about these coefficients, uh, then uh, there is no big deal. I mean, you can replace these x's and y's with elements from the central closure, and uh, we can consider convex polytopes for uh, that sort of elements. And hopefully, if you'll figure out how to use them, then we can use them instead of variables. Fortunately, there is a very nice idea how we can handle uh, these uh, convex polytopes in case of elements of the central closure. Unfortunately for us, we needed one fact from convex geometry, uh, which is related to the representation of a convex polytope in the union on the small convex polytopes. And we didn't know uh, uh, whether this fact is known or not. So we were asking many people, it turns out that nobody was able to tell us where to find it. Uh, fortunately, uh, one uh, famous mathematician from our department was able to uh, suggest us how to prove it. It was quite an interesting conversation because uh, when I, uh, we asked a lot of people how to do it, nobody helped us, then uh, it was somehow our final resort to ask Fedin Nazarov, and uh, he answered that question within one hour. It was just five sentences written in Russian with a beautiful idea how to prove the statement. But why do we really need something like this? If we can uh, write a, poly a polytope as a union of uh, small convex polytopes, we can basically control the situation inside each of these uh, small polytopes, K1 and so Kn, uh, we can assume uh, that uh, the elements uh, which correspond to these polytopes are actually nilpotent. And this was uh, what we really used in the proof. Okay, so uh, this was uh, the final fact which we really needed and we are very grateful to Fedin Nazarov who helped us uh, to solve the problem because he his uh, five sentences in Russian uh, played the key role in the proof of this fact. 
And then uh, uh, this uh, problem by Bader and a lot of other questions, because uh, there were at least four more equivalent statements were proved. Uh, however, there is one really big problem, which I hope someone will be able to solve, maybe using that technique. And this problem is due to Bader, Fong, and Kuchelowski. Uh, it uh, relates to the question about Bern's radical. So we were able to show that the polynomial ring over nil ring is brown macro radical. The question about Benz radical is a very good, important question. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, something which is uh, a bit different because I will move from polynomials to uh, skew polynomials. And uh, here is a definition of a differential polynomial ring. Uh, quite a standard definition. Uh, uh, I, I noticed that if uh, you would like to uh, search for certain results about differential polynomial rings, sometimes it can be a good idea to Google or extensions because many people are using this uh, notation. Uh, probably the easiest example of a differential polynomial ring is a Weyl algebra, which is uh, given in a bit different way. And now uh, let's talk about differential polynomial rings over nil rings. And uh, you notice I said the nil rings, but what's written here is locally nil potent. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the first question which was asked by Ivan Pavlovich Shostakov in Coimbra in 2011 is one of the most interesting questions uh, which I couldn't even believe. So actually, I would ask uh, Ivan Pavlovich three questions about his question. So first of all, uh, why it is uh, the question about locally nilpotent? I understand that this is an analogy of a Kurtz conjecture for differential polynomial rings, but why locally nilpotent? Why not nil? Second, uh, Jacobson radical. Uh, why it's Jacobson radical? Why it's not nil? And uh, uh, okay, so the, the, the last question will be related to the answer to this problem. So let me state two other questions. They are quite natural for Behrens radical and brown macro radical. For Behrens radical, it was questioned by Grinfeld, Smoktonovich, and Zimbowski. And now an absolutely shocking result. The answer to the first question is no. So uh, for me, uh, this is something which I would never expect. And now uh, my third question would be, did you expect this answer? because uh, uh, this is something uh, which totally contradicts to my intuition. Okay, the question uh, by Greenfield, Smoktonovich, and Zimbowski has a positive answer, and my students obtain much better results and much better proof. My, my students, uh, Dennis Chen, uh, Han Hagen, Alison Wang, uh, they extended uh, uh, my, my, my theorem, which answered question by Smoktonovich and Zimbowski to two variables. And very recently, uh, my student Jung uh, Shin and, and Steven Jin, uh, they uh, found another interesting extension of uh, this theorem. So if you would like to read the good proof, I mean, which I really like, then you don't read my paper, you read these two. They are much more interesting. And uh, the question about brown McCoy is a very simple uh, theorem. Uh, which is due to Agata Smoktonovich, but uh, uh, it was published in the paper by uh, Nielsen and Zimbowski. So uh, she kindly permitted them to include her result. Okay, so now uh, we are uh, coming to the embedding which we are talking about. And you can see uh, that this uh, embedding uh, is proper. So we know an example of a Behrens radical ring which is not Jacobson radical and this is exactly the example by Smoktonovich and Zimbowski which answers questions by Shostakov. And uh, uh, how to do it? Well, uh, uh, you, you use their example and then you use a theorem which I prove answer question by Greenfield, Smoktonovich and Zimbowski. And now let's talk about uh, this uh, research area, differential polynomial rings or new rings. And there are many interesting results and uh, problems in this area. In my opinion, uh, the work by Agata Smoktonovich, who was very generous and asked many questions, will help many young researchers to enter the area. Uh, you can see uh, that in her theorems, uh, there are certain conditions 
uh, they may be uh, removed or maybe there are some counter examples and, and these are two excellent questions related to uh, your theorem one. Uh, I don't know how uh, uh, to prove them or how to construct the counter example, could be very hard. Uh, and uh, here is another example of your results. Before that, I need to introduce uh, locally nilpotent derivations. So a derivation is called locally nilpotent if uh, uh, for every element, uh, derivation some power acting to that element gives us zero. A typical example would be a, a formal differentiation on the polynomial ring. Here is another example uh, of a very interesting theorem which is done for characteristic greater than zero and of course the immediate question is how about characteristic zero. Uh, I, I have no idea whether the answer is yes or no. It's a, it can be a very hard question could be doable question. And why I'm saying that could be doable? Because uh, here is a wonderful example. Uh, she asked the question uh, uh, about locally nilpotent derivations. The question is how the differential polynomial ring and the ordinary polynomial ring are connected. So uh, does it follow that if differential polynomial ring that the ordinary polynomial ring is nil? And uh, the answer is very surprising. Uh, Answer is yes, it does. And this uh, was uh, done by my students, Louisa Catalan and Megan Cheng Li. Uh, the proof is not hard. Actually, if you would look at a paper by Agata Smoktonovich with this uh, second theorem, uh, then uh, uh, they were using ideas by Agata and, and uh, they were able uh, to prove this result. It's a short paper and uh, quite, quite an interesting uh, approach. So Ag Agat is very generous, asking many good, interesting questions. Now let me uh, tell you a few words about what I was doing recently. So in my uh, theorem with uh, Kevin Fon, uh, we were uh, looking for uh, differential polynomial rings over nil rings. And uh, we uh, were uh, quite curious about the following uh, statement. So whether we can use some technique which we enjoy, uh, namely uh, Harchenka's technique of differential uh, of differential identities. And uh, we are able to prove this theorem. Uh, the paper hopefully will be published this year. At least it's uh, published online. And then you can also see that we have a condition, field of characteristic zero. We needed this condition because we wanted to use uh, Harchenka's theorem. And uh, naturally, we ask the question, okay, how about the case of characteristic greater than zero? And I, I'm very happy to tell you that this question has a positive answer. The answer was obtained by two Brazilian mathematicians, uh, Wagner Cortez and Edison Miranda. Uh, the answer to this question is yes. And uh, they uh, were using technique by Puchilovsky and Smoktonovich from 1998, and they found a very smart way how to modify it. So they didn't use any uh, differential identities, which uh, in my opinion uh, is a pity because it would be interesting to see how to extend Harshenka's theory for some other rings. And you may guess that uh, we would like to see the solution to uh, the following problem, uh, whether the polynomial ring, uh, differential polynomial ring or new ring is a Behrens radical. Uh, right now, uh, we have no idea whether the answer will be yes or no. Could be a very interesting question. Okay, so I guess I spoke for 45 minutes. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, let us thanks. Okay. Questions, questions, comments? I just, <clears throat> I just want to comment. Mikhail asked questions about my question. I just want to say one of the reasons. In fact, you know that a locally nilpotent ring doesn't have uh, irreducible bimodulus. Uh, well, more or less like the same that there are no, it cannot be simple. 
or it cannot have a reducible bimodulus. But assume we have a ring with derivation. So I was interested in that time whether a new ring with derivation can have a reducible bimodule with derivations. So, but in fact, it was quite clear for me for it's more naturally to ask for local nil photon because nil ring can have without derivation has irreducible bimodulus. Just take nil sin ring constructed by Agata, and it will be an irreducible bimodulus. But what about local nil photon? Uh, uh, in fact, it had the relations also with some questions in alternative and classification of alternative bimodulus. Mm -hmm. So that's more or less how it can be reformulated in terms of Jacobson radical and so on and so on. If you, but came from this question, you have a ring with derivation, locally important, whether it can admit uh, a reducible bimodulus with derivation, with derivation. And the answer became, well, for me it was, I expected to have a positive answer, but there was a counterexample. By the way, it is a counterexample of theorem, but it was, it's still it's interesting for me to have an exact example of such bimodal or uh, local important ring with derivation and bimodal with derivation, which is irreducible. Okay, there were some other also arguments, but I just say only this just now. Uh, more questions, comments? Привет, Миша. Здравствуйте, Леонид Григорьевич. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for me, it was also a pleasure to listen. It was not very often in nowadays to listen about classical ring theory and some old classical problems. Thank you very much. So if there are no more questions, let's thanks again. For the next Thursday, we will have a talk of uh, Drazen Adamovich from University of Zagreb, Croatia. He will speak <coughs> logarithmic and we take care modulus for a fine vertex algebras. Okay, see you in a week. Thank you for participation. Bye bye.